Please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Zion. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. My uh, speech teacher back in college always taught me that I'm supposed to start off every presentation to a new audience with a bit of an anecdote to connect, but uh, he was sort of an ass, so we're just going to jump into it. <laughs> Whoa, too close to something over here. Most Americans are convinced that the United States is in decline. Uh, the funny thing is, if you go back and you look at public opinion polls going back to 1880, we've always believed that. <laughs> Yet the United States is the only country in human history that has entered ever, I'm sorry, exited every decade in a stronger military and economic position than it entered it. And we've been doing that now for 14 consecutive decades. The Chinese have done that for three. The Brits during the period of empire did it for six, 14. We need to understand why. It's this map. At the center of the map, you'll see the interconnected waterways of the greater Mississippi. We're actually on the shore of one of the cities of that right now. And off the coast, you've got the intercoastal waterway. Put together, that's about 15,000 miles of interconnected waterway. Now, why, why is that important? Two things. One, moving stuff from A to B is a bit of a bitch. But moving it by water is actually pretty easy. In terms of locomotion costs, it's 1 15th the cost. Once you add in everything that, from the taxes that go into the infrastructure, it's about 1 50th to 1 70th the cost based on where you are. The United States has 15,000 miles in one system. The rest of the world combined has 13,000 miles. So it doesn't matter if we elect a monkey or, based on your personal preferences, another monkey, you know, whatever. We're going to be okay because we have this as an advantage and it overlays the greatest chunk of arable land on the planet. We are always gonna be capital rich as a result because it's just cheaper for us to move things from A to B. Second, we are the only country on the planet that has a spatial orientation that allows us to have a major population on both trading basins. So when the Asians are in recession, we can trade with the Europeans. When the Europeans are in recession, we can trade with the Asians. When we're in recession, we export it to the world because we're just that kind of people. That's, that's not really a joke. Every recession we've had since 1945 has gone global. We have yet to import one. As a side effect of this, we have the world's most unified financial space because if you're on that network, it doesn't really matter if you're in Minnesota and you're borrowing from a Georgia bank. You're all literally in the same boat from the network. We identify with each other. We have the largest projection-based military in the world because we have oceans protecting us on both sides, vast open spaces to the north and the south. So when we build a military, it's not to defend a border, it's to project. We keep problems away from our shores. And as a side effect, we have the largest consumer market in the world, roughly $12 trillion right now. The rest of the global total is $13 trillion. So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, remember this, you're gonna be fine. Even if we have a third Obama term and halfway through he dies and George W. Bush somehow becomes president, and if the whole time Secretary of State Clinton, that's Bill, not Hillary, and uh, his intern squad of the Swedish bikini team comes in, we're gonna be okay. Because wow, we've done a lot worse than the current leaders and I'm not saying that they're great right now. Okay, so, you should be feeling pretty good. Let's talk about why you're not feeling very good. Back in what we Americans think of as the ancient part of history, the world was imperial. The French Navy protected French trade between the French mainland and the French colonies, the British Navy did the same, and so on. It was a series of sequestered imperial economic and military systems. You didn't want to trade with your immediate neighbor, because if you did, and you went to war with them next Tuesday, that trade would disappear and your economy would immediately fall into depression. So you had set up your own system and you enforced it with your own weapons. This led to, ultimately, World War II. And at the end of World War II, the Americans said, you know, we're gonna cut that shit out. And we created a fundamentally new economic structure called Bretton Woods. What it did is it said, everyone can trade with everyone else. We will open our market, the largest market in history, and the only really one to survive the war, and we will absorb anything you can export. 
We will use our navy to guarantee freedom of the seas, to make sure that no one, pirates, Russians, Germans, Brits, French, anybody, can interfere with the trade between any two nations, even if we're not involved. This is the foundation of the modern world. This set up, among other things, our trade deficit. This was designed. We did this to ourselves on purpose. How were we able to enforce it? Well, pretty straightforward. <laughs> See, the one, on the, the one on the left, that's a supercarrier. The one on the right is a traditional jump carrier. There are about 10 jump carriers in the world. There are, none of them are American. There are 10 supercarriers in the world. They're all American, and each one has five to seven times the firepower of the little guys. If you were to sail the entire combined blue water fleet of the world against the United States, two of these could end it in about six hours. The United States has more projection tonnage than the rest of the world combined by a factor of three. This is how we forced a new economic system on the world. We did it to fight the Cold War. We used our economy to underwrite everybody else into an alliance that we basically bribed. And it worked fantastically. You may have noticed the Cold War ended 25 years ago. We've been coasting since then, and the American commitment to the free trade order has been dropping bit by bit by bit. Two presidents ago, the Clinton administration, NAFTA and the WTO were ratified and implemented. This president has started zero free trade negotiations and finished zero. Whether it happens in one day of anger or a decade of neglect, we are moving away from this model. Fun thing is, we never bet our system on it in the first place. For us, it was a strategic gambit, not an economic one. As a percentage of GDP, there are only three countries on this planet that are less integrated to the wider world than we are. Brazil, Rwanda, and South Sudan. 14% of our GDP is from exports. One third of that is oil. Guess what Shale's doing to that? Of the remainder, two-thirds of our trade portfolio is in the Western Hemisphere. Half of it is just with NAFTA. The United States is an isolated economy and the biggest economy and the most secure economy. Let's talk demography. All right. You can split any population into three general categories. First, you have your young workers, people roughly aged 20 to 45. These are the folks that are having kids, going to college, buying cars, buying homes. They're big spenders. This is where mo most of the growth in a consumer-led economy comes from. However, they're at the beginning of their system, so they don't have a lot of money, so they have to borrow to fund all of this stuff. Second, you've got your mature workers, people roughly 40 to 65. The kids are mostly moved out, the house is mostly paid for, they're at the top of their earning experience. But they don't have a lot of debt, they don't have a lot of consumption, so this is where the investment in the system comes from. And normally it's a strict system, small generation providing credit to a larger generation. Things like business plans matter, collateral matters. And finally, you have your retirees. They've made their nest egg, they take it away, they put it in cash, generate sorts of investment that don't generate much of an income and also don't generate a lot of economic growth. Here's Canada. Do we have any Canadians in the room? It's got to be at least. There we go. What is wrong with you people? About 1965, you forgot how to have kids. Look at that. No replacement generation coming up. You've got a big bulge of mature workers. And you know, I spent some quality years in Canada when I was a kid, and I can tell you, you've got the basics down. You're just missing something. So right now, Canada is the most capital rich it has ever been. Interest rates are at the floor, you can buy a house for pennies on the dollar once you figure in the interest costs. It's a great time to be up there. The Alberta oil boom, for example, was funded because of this demographic. But you fast forward a few years, and that bulge moves into retirement, and there isn't a replacement generation to pay taxes, or one behind that to generate growth. So Canada is in the equivalent of going up a cliff and it's about to jump off from a financial point of view. Here's the United States. Let's start with the boomers. Who are the folks in the room who were born between 1945 and 1965? Hands up. Okay, quite a few boomers. The current world, if you want to blame someone for it, blame them. <laughs> Medicare, Monica Lewinsky, subprime, these are all their fault. Let's start with the more serious of those, subprime. 
Boomers are the largest generation as a percentage of the population in American history. As such, they swarmed in hordes into the labor market when they hit age 20 to 25. They competed with each other for such, so it was such anger that they drove prices down for labor across the board. That's why so many of them are two-parent homes. I'm sorry, two, 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 two income homes, because they had to be. You play that forward to where they are right now at the mature level, where they're paying in taxes in mass and they're nearing retirement, and they have the same problem. They're competing for investment opportunities. And so they're pushing money into anything that they think might eke out another percent or two of returns. And this is where subprime comes from. This is where the developing world boom of the last 15 years comes from. It's boomer money looking to make a little bit more before they retire. Gen Y, these are people born 1980 to 1999. All right, you guys are the second largest generation as a percentage of the population in American history. You're the boomers' kids writ large. You are the best educated population that we've ever had. However, you face the same existential crisis as your parents. There's too many of you. And you're competing for jobs just like your parents did which is driving down your earning potential, which means you still live at home. <laughs> and then Gen X, people born 1966 roughly to 1980. Okay, we're the smallest generation, I'm in that group, right in the middle, we're the smallest generation ever in this country. And when we came into the workforce, there were so many boomers that we didn't hardly earn anything. We are the internal intern generation. Now, as the boomers retire, we're both middle and upper management from a small pool. And so what we've seen among Gen X is much higher rates of family formation in our early years because we had to to get by, but much higher incomes and more stable families as we get older because the retiring boomers are leaving this huge space open for us. The downside we've discovered is that Gen Y will never vote for Social Security or Medicare reform. Because if they do that, their parents move in with them. <laughs> so something the boomers and Gen Y agree upon is that X should pay for everything. <laughs> Here's the United States versus the rest of the developing world. And you can see that the developing world writ large has roughly the same problem that the Canadians do. But check this out, 15 years from now, when Gen Y matures, and I use that in the loosest possible way, <laughs> they will eventually be able to reach that mature worker area, they will fill out the growth profile, and the budget battles that we see right now will finally end. Now, it'll take 15 years. We've got 15 more years of this crap. This, if it, but look at this. The developed world. What the hell happened? And this, this, this is actually the good picture, because this has US data in it. Let's remove the US. The rest of the developed world becomes an old folks home. They're not gonna buy a lot of American crap or anybody else's crap. But wow, healthcare, that'll be big. A few specific examples. Japan is the fastest, and old, fastest aging and oldest economy in the world. Uh, their consumption boom is completely over. Italy is past the point of demographic recovery. It will have ever shrinking populations. And because they don't have anybody in this block, they're all up here and getting older, consumption-led growth can never happen in Italy ever again. So the European financial crisis, it's as good as it's going to be right now. And it's only going to last for 10 years because Germany has a similar problem, but they're even older. So right now, Germany can afford the bailouts. They've got a big chunk of people with that tax paying pop, kind of like where our boomers are. But when they retire, Germany can't afford it anymore. So Europe has about 10 years to figure out how to deal with no positive economic growth ever again. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> People think China is a superpower. Sorry, one-child policy. That spike of the 25 to 30-somethings, that one chunk is the entirety of the Chinese consumption boom. And in five years, it'll be over. And if the Chinese want to replace that generation, if they start right now, and I mean like go out in the lobby and get to it, it will be 25 years before the new generation can actually replace the consumption. Because you can't just pop out a 25-year-old. 
Okay. Does this mean that there are no problems, that the United States uh, doesn't have any challenges as to power, to security, and wealth? No, that's not what it means. It does mean that structurally we're in a great spot, and no matter how hard we try, we really can't screw it up. Uh, we can always do better. But let's talk about the biggest challenge, and that's energy. So this, this is the world at night. This is where the people with money live, because they can afford to have lights. Here's where the world's conventional oil and natural gas is. Watch Arabia and North America. Here's where the shale is. Sometimes it's really that simple. In the process of producing the 7 million barrels of crude, shale crude that we are right now, we have cut global energy consumption by almost a half a million barrels per day simply because we don't have to ship it from halfway around the world. We don't have to worry about security issues, we don't have to worry about supply issues, and it's generated probably about 400,000 direct and indirect jobs already. But here's the really fun part. Blue is American oil production, the double hash, that's 2006, that's where shale really started to take off. The red and the green, that's imports from Canada and Mexico. You can just see how it's just spiked. North America's up to 15 million barrels per day, we've never been that high. Here's American oil consumption. Now in 2007, three things happened at once. One, we had a recession, so energy demand dropped, but it hasn't recovered. Number two, we have something called demand destruction. When you hold oil prices over about $70 a barrel for an extended period of time, people start to change their habits in a long-term way. They put solar panels on their house. They buy a hybrid. They force the kid to move out. You know, things that take years to adjust for. And so that demand is destroyed. Third, and most importantly, is demographic. When you're 30, you drive to work. You take the kids to soccer practice. When you're 55, you just drive to work. When you're 70, your kids take away your car. <laughs> per capita energy consumption declines with age. In 2007, the oldest of the boomers retired. Oh, hey, photo. <laughs> and so the United States is looking at spiking oil production, but over the next 20 years, declining oil consumption. There's been talk about, you know, shale doing this or that, but I'll tell you right now, we're looking at de facto North American energy independence in less than three years. Might not even be that song. Whoa, whoa, wait for it. <laughs> Americans are crazy. What we do with that is another issue. <laughs> but something to keep in mind, we're already exporting 1.5 million barrels per day of oil product. So it might be more like two years. The question is no longer will the United States be able to divorce itself from the world in terms of energy. The question is how will the United States act once it does. Now can't some of the other countries out there with bad demographies or poor, uh, uh, poor prospects for consumption replace this with some shale of their own? Well not really, there's five things you need. One, you need a metric butt ton of capital. Each well costs anywhere from four to eleven million dollars to drill. There's six on each pad. And each well only produces an average of 75 barrels a day over the course of its lifetime. So you need lots and lots of these things. Second, you need engineers to do all this. You need people who are skilled in geology and fluid dynamics and engineering and who can operate without supervision two miles from where they can see. That's as hard as it sounds. Third, you need a legal system of property rights, mineral rights, that allow locals to benefit from the activity. Fourth, you need an infrastructure that can move stuff from A to B. With oil, it's not so much, but with gas, I mean, think about what natural gas is. <gasps> It's hard to move. It has to be in a pressurized system that goes from pre-existing points of supply to pre-existing points of demand, chicken and egg. And then finally, it all has to match up with where your people live. Now, here in the United States, on a one to five scale, we've got all five of these. We've got the deepest and largest capital market on the planet. We have more petroleum engineers than the rest of the planet put together. We're the only country in the world with the concept of mineral rights. Can you, can you imagine in Texas what it would be like if the Obama administration came in and said, oh, we're gonna drill here, 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 Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, next Saturday. Oh, yeah, but birthday party, that's nice. And you don't get any money for it. There'd be words. <laughs> we're the only country with a truly national infrastructure for transporting gas, and it's all positioned just outside, just magically, coincidentally, outside of our major metropolitan areas. The one exception, of course, being Fort Worth, where they don't mind drilling in town. 
You do not have this anywhere else in the world. You could fit everyone in the Middle East who knows petroleum engineering of this type in the front row of this middle section. And they would need 100,000 of them in order to have a shale revolution. The former Soviet Union has some great shale. It's in the permafrost. And as you know from permafrost, it's frozen in the winter and it's a swamp in the summer. So the only time you can drill is when it's 50 below and dark. You use water for fracking. So you have to melt the water to pump it into frozen, yeah, it just doesn't work. Oh, and there are no roads, because it's a freaking permafrost. Uh, Europe had the money, or at least it did until they had their financial crisis, and China comes in almost dead last on all of these. The only shale field that they had that's really worth developing is in a secessionist region. Oops. So let's talk about some economic sectors. Wow, I'm gonna go way over time. <laughs> okay, first things first. Things are gonna get weirder before they get more normal because the boomers haven't all retired yet. And when you are 40, you save a little bit of your income that's relatively small. When you're 50, you save a little bit more of your income, which is relatively large. And when you're 64 and a half, you save almost everything you can. So your amount of savings, the amount of money you're pumping into the system gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the day after you retire, you don't put a cent in ever again. Subprime, dot-com bubble, Indian boom, Brazilian boom, Chinese boom, bam, nothing. The magic year is probably between 2019 and 2021, because at that point, the majority of the boomer generation across the developed world moves into retirement. So things are gonna get stranger and stranger and stranger, and then they're gonna get normal real fast. Second, the Europeans aren't playing this game. Three years ago, they had a bailout in Cyprus, and they decided that the best way to pay for that bailout was to take insured bank deposits. Can you imagine this? Your passport account, your checking account, take the money out of them and throw it at the bailout. As a result, anyone who had money in a European bank who had the option of moving it did. Europe went from being the world's largest currency in resolving trade, trade finance, to number four in three years. It is disappearing from central banks' balance sheets, from companies, funds, just melting away. And in 15 years, Europe will melt away because Europe writ large is soon or it's on a track to be even older than China and Japan. And check out this. Average age in 2025. We are not just the youngest culture. We're going to be the youngest culture for a good long time. In 2019, the Chinese pass us. When we think of problems like obesity or diabetes or elder care, the Chinese problem is huge compared to us. That is not a glass of bourbon, I'm, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> that is a glass of light, sweet crude from the Eagleford Shale, about 100 miles south of where I live. Unlike most crude, shale is trapped almost at the molecular level within the formation. So it never has a chance to migrate out. It doesn't go through areas of rock and pick up contaminants like sulfur or mercury. So when you pull it out of the ground, you kind of wave a white chicken in front of it and you get gasoline. It's very easy to work with. So the United States is retooling its entire refining base, particularly in the middle of the country, to run on what is the highest quality crude ever produced. The last time we cared about a hurricane was about 2006. All shale production is on shore. Hurricanes don't affect it. And the, actually, the natural gas production in the Gulf has largely been shut down because we don't need it anymore. So that's our piggy bank for whenever shale runs out, whether that's in 30 years or 200 years, probably closer to 30. Next, the nature of American energy is changing. The big energy players, Exxon, Chevron, all those guys, they look for the super fields. They can stick a straw in and produce gobs and gobs of oil, but the average petroleum well in a shale field is only 75 barrels. They're not interested. They don't know how to operate there. So what we've seen is production in the United States is changing from the very, very large oil companies to the very, very small oil companies and there's thousands of players in that field, the super majors are being squeezed out. They're already passed, they've already dropped below the majority, and they're probably gonna be less than 20% of total American production within five years. Same thing has happened in refineries, because you don't need the capital and the sophistication of Exxon to run a refinery where the most important piece of equipment is a white chicken. All my dictators are dying on me. 
It's really depressing. Okay, so Chavez, you may have heard, doesn't really care for the Americans very much. So what he did is he went to the Chinese. He's like, look, hey, I want to sell you my crude. And the Chinese told him to get out of here because your crude sucks. It's like toothpaste. It's contaminated. It's, it's borderline toxic. He's like, well, what if I pay you to take it? And the Chinese are like, really? It's like, I will, I will subsidize the transport around South America and across the Pacific the wrong way. I will pay for any damage done to your refineries, and I will kick in an extra 10% because you're not going to be able to get this full amount of products out of my crew that you could out of better crew. So Chinese like, okay, sign on the dotted line, sail a couple of tankers into Maracaibo, load up the thick gooey stuff, take it north across the Gulf of Mexico, sell it to the Americans, and pocket the difference. They've been doing this for eight years. Now, this would just be a funny little story about the stupidity of blind ideology, if not for shale. Because shale is forcing the entire American refinery complex to retool for light, sweet crude. So in five years, when that process is completed, Venezuela will be the first energy producer in human history to have destroyed its own market. Say it with me. <laughs> Agriculture can be complex, but really all it comes down to is you're producing a huge volume of stuff that you have to move to a consumer. The problem that the Brazilians have is right here. Here's their production zone, and these are what we like to call mountains. There's a gap right here at Sao Paulo. It's the only place you can get down, but it's still a cliff. Ever tried to move a tanker car down a cliff? There you can see it at night. No one lives on the Brazilian coast because it's freaking cliff. So you have one city point, everything else is inland. Transport costs. This is how the Brazilians move grain. The cliff is so steep, they can't even send sub or semis down it, so they have to use half trucks. 38 trucks in this map. This is part of a 200-mile traffic jam that happens every harvest season. Here's how we move grain. If you take all the grain and all 38 of those trucks and load them into the barges down there, they will fill one-third of one of the 15 of those barges sailing through St. Louis. Transport costs in excess of 150 times what they are here. Brazil only does well in a system of cheap capital, that's on a deadline, free trade, that's on a deadline, and Chinese demand. We're looking at a lot of the countries that are blue and green on this map kind of disappearing in terms of food producers. This is the percentage of grain-based calories you have to import. Blue and green means that you're a net exporter. All the others mean you're a net importer. Red and orange being very bad. That means you have imported at least half. Look at the Middle East. This is a region that we have some issues with. But think about what this means. They import over half their food. In a world without free trade, in a world without easy credit, that's, that's disastrous. So the instability that we've seen until now, that's just the warm-up. Because right now, everyone's still getting fed. When people don't get lunch, things get nasty. You guys have all calmed down quite a bit, I've noticed, since 11 o'clock. <laughs> Country of the hour, I think, is going to be Iran. I see that Iran is going to be probably our best friend in the not-too-distant future. What we have here are missile ranges. The green is the biggest that they've claimed. We've never actually seen them go that far because it would mean that the missile had to land outside of their country. We kind of watch for that sort of thing. But you can see how the green line just barely makes it into northern Minnesota, right? Yeah, whatever. Iran is not a conventional threat to us. If they were, it would have been a problem a long time ago. If they were going to develop a nuke, they would have done it under the last administration, which was a little bonkers. But look at their neighborhood. To the east is Pakistan, where we found Osama bin Laden hanging out less than three miles from their equivalent of West Point. Anybody want to let the Pakistani government watch the kids? Anybody? <laughs> There's usually one jackass. Okay. To the north are the Russians. They're a little spunky these days, aren't they? To the east, is, or to the west, is Iraq. Anybody want to go back? And to the south, we have Saudi Arabia, which is probably the only country out there that really gets it. Why do they get it? Oil. We have protected them and their oil shipments, either directly or indirectly via Bretton Woods, since World War II. That protection is starting to falter because we're losing interest very rapidly, and they see it. They've started pre-positioning cargoes in the Gulf of Mexico because no one's called them for crude in over two years. We haven't needed it. And so 
when you have a country that is as pampered as Saudi Arabia, when your military does not function well outside of air conditioning, you have to come up with a new defense strategy. So what they do is they've combed our country for malcontent young men with a penchant for violence. They strap a bomb on their back, put a Quran in their pocket, get them high on cot, and send them into Syria. We've seen this before. We know where it ends. Al-Qaeda, ISIS. This is the origin of groups like that. It's not a strategy we really care for. But that's what they have to do to survive. That's what they feel they have to do. Now, if you are Iran, and you're looking around this neighborhood, I mean, think about what these four countries have in common. Iran hates them all. All the United States has to do to get Iran to scramble this whole region like a bad omelet is not a goddamn thing. It's their neighborhood. They see it as their problem. Now, we can provide some intelligence, we can play sides, we don't have to, but we have the option. But let's assume for the moment that you don't believe it, that the bad blood between us and Iran is too bad. Check out right here, Carg Island at the north end of the Gulf. This is the export point for 95% of Iran's crude. Now think about what that means. Think about what the Persian Gulf and Iran means. In the Bretton Woods era, we used free access to energy to guarantee trade, to build an alliance, to guarantee our security. We're secure, we don't need the alliance anymore, we don't use the trade anymore, we don't need the energy anymore. Persian Gulf is still a pressure point, but it's our pressure point now. It takes an aircraft carrier battle group to keep the Gulf open. It takes a destroyer to close it. And Karg Island doesn't even have a bridge going to it. With one sortie, we can take Iran out of the international economy for years. Food for thought. Oh, what's he gonna say about the greens? <laughs> The red line is the Kyoto goal, 90% of two, I'm sorry, 90% of 1990 emissions. The black line, that's Japan. You can, it's obvious where Fukushima happened. They switched from nuclear to coal, and their emissions skyrocketed. That is probably going to go up for at least another five years, and that is assumes that they turn the nuclear plants back online. Here's Europe and Germany, Germany being the blue. At unification, things were pretty bad, the economy, fell, and then you didn't have a lot of growth through the 2000s. In 2007, you had the recession and it dropped, but you also had Energy Wind, which was their energy program. And then, and then what? The German energy, pro who here has been to Germany? When you were in Germany, if you look up, what do you see? Clouds. The sun doesn't shine in Germany. <laughs> they spent half a trillion euro putting in, installing the biggest solar array system ever, and they're still number one. It is large enough, in theory, nameplate capacity to generate 60% of their peak demand. It only actually generates 4% of their electricity. Because the sun doesn't shine in Germany! <laughs> Here's the United States. We didn't sign Kyoto. We were like, that's a bad idea. And so our emissions went up and up and up, kind of stabilized through the 2000s because we became more information-based. There's the recession, and then what? Shale is displacing coal writ large through the entire American system. It's already knocked about one-third of it offline. It'll probably knock another one-third off over the course of the next three or four years. Now, I realize that's not good for everybody. If you're in eastern Kentucky and it's coal country, that's a problem. But it is very likely that three years from now, the only major industrialized country to meet its Kyoto commitments is going to be the United States, which means if there is another global climate treaty, it will be written in the White House, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. Now think about what that does to the green movement, because there's a distinct possibility that by the time this happens, the biggest green energy state will be Texas. Can you imagine Texas <laughs> writing the global greenhouse gases <laughs> treaty. <laughs> I'm a green, just blows my mind, but that's where we're going. Okay, flavor of the month, obviously, are the Russians. 
uh, we have to understand where the Russians are coming from before you can say, oh, they're just crazy, what are they doing, why are they being so aggressive? Okay, first things first, the birth rate collapsed at the end of the Soviet period. There are now more 50-somethings than there are teenagers, and most of the teenagers have tuberculosis. So the Russian capacity to maintain a consumer-based system is already gone, and their capacity to maintain the Red Army in just five years uh, is not even questionable anymore. They know they will have less than half the number of soldiers that they have right now. So if the Russians are gonna move militarily on anything ever, they have to do it now. Number two is actually worse. The Russian educational system, after you finish with college, you then go into an apprenticeship program for several years where you train with a skilled engineer. That system collapsed back in 1988, was never reconstituted, they've never had the money. Which means that the youngest cadre of people with the full suite of technical training are now in their 50s. The average age of Russian male mortality is 59. Russia is going from the country with the highest skilled labor cost to becoming a country with no skilled labor pool. The missile forces, the rail network, the Red Army, the natural gas system, the oil system, all of them are gonna break down in the next 10 years. So again, if they're gonna move, they have to move now. So that's the why now, here's the why. The green area in the middle, if you're gonna live in Russia, that's the place to live. It's not too cold, not too hot, well, let me rephrase that. It is too cold, it is too hot, uh, but it's, it's livable. This is the wheat belt. It goes right down the spine of Eurasia. We got Europe at the top there, what we consider Asia at the bottom. Now, at the edges of this, you've got shoulder territories that aren't so hostile that you can't move through them, but they are too hostile to have substantial populations. So these big, wide open spaces, the Eurasian steppe. Beyond them, you've got physical barriers. The Karakum Desert, the Carpathian Mountains, the Ten Xien. Russian porn, foreign policy, going back centuries, has been to expand through those buffer areas and anchor in those obstacles and then concentrate their forces on the access points. The southern two, the Mongols used to conquer Russia several times. The westernmost ones, the Persians used. The northeastern ones, excuse me, the northwestern ones, the Turks used. The Germans have never met a square inch of Poland that they did not thoroughly enjoy marching across. <laughs> the Swedes came in three times from the Baltic, and even the Canadians invaded via the White Sea. Anyone with a boat played in that one. So for the Russians to survive, they've got to expand and anchor. If they don't do that, they're doomed. And they're going to be doomed pretty soon because of their demographics. So here's the general plan as it's being played out right now. The red, that's your ethnic Russians. The orange are people who are not ethnic Russians, but who speak Russian, consider themselves at least affiliated. And the greens, that's what I like to call the Stockholm Syndrome states. They really miss the Soviet Union. They want to be Russian. They just want to be brought into the fold. So based on your politics, they're either collaborators or helpers. Step one, grab the crane. Oh, I'm sorry. There's the five anchors that we're concerned about. These are the access points in the West. Step one, grab the Crimea, check. Step two, destabilize Ukraine as a country. We've seen what that's been doing over in the East. You remember when it looked like the rebels were getting beaten back by the Ukrainian military? That was a trap. The Russians waited for the Ukrainians to throw everything in and then they blew up the leadership of the entire Ukrainian military. So Ukraine as a military entity is in effect gone. The buffer zone that was established is in the process of being broken through by the rebels. And the next part of this is to start rebellions like they did in eastern Ukraine in a number of other cities that are pro-Russian. The biggest one of note is Odessa, which is actually in western Ukraine. If Odessa breaks away, Ukraine as an economic entity disappears. Ukraine's biggest export is wheat. It flows down a river, the Dnieper, to the port of Odessa. So if Odessa falls, that's it, because Ukrainian wheat is not high enough quality to be consumed in Europe. It has to go to the Black Sea, it has to go to the Mediterranean, and then out to the Middle East primarily, and they won't be able to get it out. Step three, take over the Stockholm Syndrome states formally and plug the Caucasus gaps. Step four, put Ukraine out of its misery. And step five, plug the gaps, which puts Russia into direct military conflict with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania, all of which are EU states and all of which are NATO allies. The question is time frame here. If this happens in two years, if they move that fast, the United States will probably still be engaged and we probably will send troops to Poland and Romania. But if it happens in four years, the shale revolution will have come full circuit, will be completely energy independent and we will be dependent upon the Eastern Hemisphere for less than 2% of our GDP. 
the belt of countries from Estonia down to Romania, every single one of them, and they consider our, they consider, we consider them to be some of our firmest allies, but from Estonia to Romania, all 10 of those countries are now more dependent on Russian oil and Russian natural gas in absolute and relative terms than they were when they got independence 15 years ago. 25 years ago, excuse me. Defending them is a hard sell, because basically what they're asking us to do is to bleed for them while they continue to use Russian energy. Huh? In four years, this is someone else's problem. And so we're going to be in this weird situation of the French asking the Germans to invade Poland to fight the Russians. <laughs> I love what I do. <laughs> All right, most of our GDP that's involved in trade is locked up in two countries, so let's spend the rest of the time looking at our neighbors here. Now, let's start with the Canadians. Canada has a very big shale problem. Uh, they don't have any other, well, they've got some of their own, they're not tapping, it's too expensive for them. But all of our shale energy is produced east of the Rockies and west of the Appalachians in the interior of the country. This has made a glut of oil and natural gas in the United States. There's about a 20, 10 to $20 difference between a barrel of crude in the U.S. and in the wider market. Now, all of Alberta's pipelines that send their oil and natural gas to the United States terminate in this area. So they are selling into the most super saturated market in the on the planet, supply and demand. On average, Albertan crude is at a $20 discount. Sometimes it's as much as $40. So they're getting at least a 30% knockoff of the international market. You guys remember Keystone, right? The, the prime reason that the Canadians want Keystone is if they can run this pipeline through this region and hook into supply chains in the interior of the United States, then their heavy crude can mix with the shale crude and the $2 trillion of refurbishments that are going on in the U.S. refining market don't have to be as expensive, because you won't have to retool to just do the light sweet stuff. You can do a mix. If Keystone doesn't happen, this pipeline doesn't happen, then the United States shifts entirely to light sweet in the interior, and Canadian crude has no home. It has no other way to get to the outside world. They've talked about a pipeline across BC, and BC, BC's uh, response has been going, anyway. <laughs> Ottawa's position on this is to, to Alberta is like, you still have more oil than the rest of the provinces put together, so keep producing, suck it up, do it for the country, pay your taxes. Remember this, right? Here's Alberta. Alberta is as young and highly skilled and highly paid as the rest of Canada is old and poorly skilled and poorly paid and it's diverging. Right now, this is the only province in the country that has reproduction rates above replacement. The position on Ottawa, oh, you got young people, consumers, that's great, tax the hell out of them, do it for the country. And there's Quebec, you guys all remember, I love the Quebecois, great food. Quebec moved towards independence several times. And as a result, the leaders of Ontario, the biggest province, sat down with the leaders of Quebec and they worked out a deal where Ontario pays Quebec to be part of Canada. There hasn't been a secession vote since. Well, that was great when Ontario could pay for it. Now they can't because they're aging into mass retirement. The position of Ottawa is, well, we've got Alberta to pay for it now. So for million Albertans are now paying for 35 million Canadians and 8 million Quebecois. The net tax bill right now is about $6,000 per man, woman, and child. $6,000 that they pay and they don't get back. That's over twice the disparity in, for between the poorest and the richest American states. By 2020, that number will be 20,000 ahead. So the Albertans have some things to think about. One, watch their energy industry die deal with a currency that's getting stronger and stronger, and just see the economic boom melt under them. Option two, declare independence. Courtesy of the Quebecois, courtesy of the Quebecois this is legal in Canada. The Supreme Court even ruled on it. This doesn't really solve the problems then, because you're still a foreign country. Keystone can't happen, and wow, if you thought BC was giving you the finger before, imagine what it's gonna be like now. Option three, I'm not saying that this is going to happen. <laughs> what I'm saying is that every economic, financial, diplomatic, energy, inflationary, and labor problem that Alberta has would be solved by this solution. 
and it's legal. And the secessionist party is already the second largest party in the Albertan, Albertan parliament. The ruling party is so nervous about it, they changed the license plate to remove Wild Rose, that's the name of the party, from the license plate, and they're leading in early polls for the 2016 provincial elections. It's gonna be crazy. All right, now Mexico. Uh, Mexico, to put it simply, should be a failed state. Uh, lots of highlands, the orange there that's irrigated agriculture, which is not only expensive, you'll know how it's kind of scattered about, almost leprous-like. Uh, it's not a big chunk of arable land. In fact, there's 300 different valleys, each of which have their own oligarchic family that rule them. It's very difficult to build infrastructure, and even if you do build it in one area, you can't build it in the other. Uh, it's just an expensive place to operate. In fact, the only country that has a worse geographic hand in the world is Afghanistan. Now, obviously, it's done better than Afghanistan, and that's because of spatial placement. It's right next to the United States. It has a market immediately adjacent, and its demography encourages inexpensive labor. So, four things are going to make Mexico the economy to watch. It's going to be the fastest growing economy for the next half century. Number one, shale. Not theirs, ours. There are nine major trunk lines under construction that will take American shale gas into Mexico all the way down to the Mexican city core and they will end the blackouts in the manufacturing zones. Right now, we're sending them three BCF a day. Within three years, it's gonna be 10, and by 2020, it's probably gonna be something like 15. It will make it the largest bilateral energy relationship on the planet. Second, China's fallen off the map. Chinese labor costs have sextupled in the last 12 years. Mexican labor is now cheaper and more highly skilled than Chinese labor, and there's been a reshoring boom back to Mexico. Third, demographically. Big bulge of young workers, gonna keep labor costs down. Also, they're a growing market in their own right, which people are starting to notice. They're the world's 12th largest economy already. Fourth, the drug war is probably the best thing that's ever happened to them from an economic point of view. That requires a bit of explanation. <laughs> people invest in Mexico because it's cheap labor. It's much cheaper than American labor. The bigger that deferential, the more sense it makes to invest in Mexico to produce goods there to export here. The drug war pushes Mexican labor prices down. So it's a, bit, it's a bit ass backwards, but the war has drastically increased investment into the country and therefore increased trade. So we're in this weird place where a boom in the United States generates income that we use to buy Mexican goods, furthering integration. Chaos in Mexico pushes down Mexican labor prices, which has a boom in trade, which furthers integration. So the question is not, should or should we not integrate with Mexico? It is already the largest bilateral people movement, legally, relationship in the world. Energy, very soon will be the energy movement, largest agricultural cross-border trade. We're there, it's done. The question is how do we manage it? There is, of course, a, a little complication. You guys all uh, remember Miami Vice, right? Hookers and Blow, great family show. That was about local law enforcement in Miami trying to combat a transcontinental economic phenomenon. Cocaine came up from Colombia and Venezuela through the Lesser Antilles around Cuba, because Cuba would just shoot anybody that tried to get in, excuse me, and into Miami. Now, the United States is the global naval superpower, so once the Cold War ended, we decided to do something about this, and we started shooting down planes that were flying 10 feet over the water at night with no lights on. And the route shattered into a thousand smaller routes that terminated in Central America and Southern Mexico, places where the Coast Guard could not go. They percolated through Mexico, cocaine prices increased by a factor of 10 along the way, and fighting over that 60 to 100 billion dollars a year of transport emerged the cartels who fought for the transport routes. And now the cartels are doing the same thing that any other multinational corporation would do that doesn't control their full supply chain. They're trying to control their supply chain. To control their supply chain. So they've expanded up their supply chain into Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, where they're now interfacing directly with the coca producers. This is one of the reasons that the peace process in Colombia looks very favorable, because the cartels are killing the FARC. They're also expanding down the supply chain into the United States, taking over retail distribution from the American gang network. One of the reasons that the American labor, excuse me, one of the reasons the American murder rate has dropped so much in the last five years is that the cartels are killing the people who do the killing. And it won't take a lot more time 
for everything from the Hells Angels in Vancouver to the Crips and the Bloods in Los Angeles to the black gangs in Atlanta are just gone or co-opted. And then they'll start doing here what they do at home, and they'll start fighting their sell each other for market share. So don't worry about Iran or Russia or China or the Europeans or the stability of the Italian fashion industry. Worry about this. I've discovered that Americans aren't happy unless they have something to worry about. This is something you can worry about. I think that, yeah, well, you know, I'm only five minutes over. That's not too bad. So if you like what I had to say, you know, bring me back next year. It's a big world. There's lots of topics. And if not, buy the book anyway. <laughs> Here's a few of the, uh, the forecasts that I didn't get a chance to get to. Uh, they're just a sampling. Oh, 32 days. I'm excited. So I think at this point is where people are supposed to throw tomatoes at me and start yelling angry things. So the how about it? It's a chair thing. We'll give you a chance to sit down for a minute oh, okay, and, sure. and, and uh, tee up some questions here. There are microphones. I might wander. Well, you can wander too. Okay. Absolutely. No, no, no problem with that. We like wandering. You have wandered far and wide today. <laughs> um, as we're teeing up the microphones, let me, uh, just before time completely runs out, you have a Kentucky connection. Yes. I did grad Tell school at the that. University of Kentucky at the Patterson School of Diplomacy. So is this... <laughs> And if you're having dinner with me tonight, be ready for bourbon, just, just to be ready. Let's go straight to questions over here on the right. Hi, I'm Warren Edminster from uh, Murray State University. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, you talked a little bit about the EU demographics and banking and so on. How does uh, Great Britain compare? Uh, let's complex question. Let's start with, with the situation in Europe. Uh, there are very few countries in Europe where the demographics are even remotely positive. The two closest would be France and Sweden. They're the only ones that are even close to replacement rates. Obviously, the Germans can't talk about population policy without a lot of people getting very nervous. <laughs> the problem when it comes to finance is that unlike here, where the rivers kind of are shared property, communal, if you will, uh, in Europe they're not. They're national. So the Loire is a French river that generates French commerce and French profits that are deposited into French banks. And the Rhine is a German river that does the same for the Germans. And so they never combined their banking sectors when they did the Maastricht Treaty on Monetary Union. Even now, this banking union that they're talking about won't take effect for five years, and its total bailout fund will be under 50 billion euros in five years. Whereas in the United States, uh, when the crisis hit in September of 2007, the FDIC chairwoman, the uh, secretary, uh, of the Treasury and the Fed Chairman squeezed around a two-top, literally, and in an hour hammered out the bailout program and funded it in the next 48 hours. In Europe, after six years of summits, they still don't have a plan. Uh, and everything runs on banks there. Here it's about half sto stock market, there it's about 80% banks. So without the banks working, uh, Europe can't grow. The UK, obviously, is in a different package. Their, their demographics are a little bit better, but that's not really the key thing. They, they still have their currency. And so I don't mean to suggest that the United Kingdom has nothing but strength ahead of us. They got some tough times, too. But they don't have any problems when the euro goes down. In fact, the capital flight into London will be enormous. The biggest problem they'll face from that is it's going to push the pound up to such levels that the rest of the uh, economy, everything that's not in finance, is going to have a problem surviving. So you'll probably see the Brits do some currency manipulation. But when we think of what we did with QE, they did five times that as a percentage of GDP. So they've got, they've got flexibility where no one in Europe does. So there's still a rough patch ahead. I don't mean to suggest otherwise. And it's one of the few countries that I think the United States will continue, continue to interface with on both economic and military policies. Uh, but it's still going to be rough. Tell Hi. us who you are and where you're from. Hi, I'm Evan Wright from Atherton High School, and I was wondering, uh, a lot of policy analysts say that, continue to complain that Europe isn't uh, contributing to the defense initiatives that America's taking. Mm -hmm. And as you said, this demographic transition is going to uh, cause crises in Europe. How, how will this affect the, um, the U.S. military's establishment to want to shift its defense initiatives from Europe to uh, the Pacific and Asia? Sure. Um, there's a lot of conventional wisdom in that statement. Some I have to pick out, some I have to underline, so, so bear with me here. Uh, the design of the European militaries and the low amount that they're spending on defense was on purpose. Not their on purpose, our on purpose. Uh, the Europeans, to be blunt, wrecked each other in World War II. 
And we wanted to make sure that as long as we were in charge, that would never happen again. So there were limits placed informally on every military there except for the British Navy. So the Europeans look back at us and we say, well, you're not doing enough for defense. And they're like, wasn't that the plan? Uh, now, of course, we're not, we didn't really start saying, we didn't say that, that during the Cold War at all. We're only saying this in the post-Cold War era. The problem we're in now is as the United States unplugs, we're leaving Europe with absolutely no ability to coordinate. Everything was ran through NATO. So even if we leave all the equipment, even if we leave all the, or, or train all the personnel, they have no firsthand experience in making Estonia work with Germany, work with Spain. That's all been managed through American infrastructure. So you're gonna have a resurgence of national militaries who don't necessarily get along. That's a problem for any number of reasons. Uh, the two that I would keep an eye on the most are France, because like Bretton Woods was our strategic policy that we didn't hitch our economy to, the EU was France's strategic policy that they never hitched their economy to. So keep, keep an eye on Paris, it's gonna be very colorful. And the second one is Sweden, because they're not in the Euro, they've got a competent military that's projection based, it's maritime, and most people have forgotten that Sweden was the last major country to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty back in the 1960s, because they thought they were gonna be fighting either the Germans or the Russians, they weren't sure which. So over a long weekend, Sweden could probably build a nuke or two. So watch, watch the Vikings, because they're freaking Vikings. <laughs> Uh, on the question of Asia, there is a lot of talk about the pivot, but really I don't expect that to count for much. China is an encapsulated power. There's a ring of archipelagos starting with Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore that block it from having a blue water navy at all. You put a few cruise missiles here and there, they're, they're locked in. So if China ever does get too bold and a war does erupt, it'll be over in a day because China imports over 70% of its oil, its natural gas, its raw materials, and all of its markets are beyond that rim. They just stop, where and they would, know that. Where would you see the U.S. military trying to pivot to, or if, I is think, there any region they would? I think you're gonna see three things. One, the, uh, the, air, the aircraft carrier task force with the new Ford class, they're not going anywhere, they're fantastic. And they have longer range and higher combat capability than even the Nimitz class ones we have right now. So we'll still have 10 of those, or at least five. Uh, two, you're gonna see an expansion of the Marines. Uh, it's something that's called a Marine Expeditionary Unit, transports 5,000 Marines at a time for whenever you really need to hit someone with a hammer. That's gonna still be there. And then get out. Uh, and then third, Special Forces. Uh, we saw the Special Forces branch almost triple under the last president. That's been expanded under Obama. And you marry Special Forces with what we can do with drones now. And that, unfortunately, is going to be our dominant way of interacting with places that we don't really care for. Uh, that means our military is still large, but it's incredibly mobile. So I don't think we're going to see another war like Iraq in the next 15 years. But I think we're going to see a lot of operations like what we're seeing in Syria right now where we stand back at arm's length, we look for the countries that are absolutely desperate for help, and then we work through them, and then we leave. Peter, I wanna say thank you for your time, and I'm sorry we are out of time, but I suspect oh. you are very approachable in, Most in, days. The, in the audience, uh, in, the, in the lobby. I haven't had lunch yet, so. so <laughs> <laughs> the Accidental Superpower by Peter Zion comes, comes soon. Thank you very much.